All right, folks, yeah, yeah. thank you guys so thank much you. again uh, for being here. For all of you online, just want to repeat the hashtag. Our Twitter hashtag is Healthier Hospitals. And uh, on, a, on, a very per on a personal note, um, I'm very excited to, to have been able to, to work with SEMA and the rest of the team to put this on. And want to give special thanks uh, to Courtney Hinkle on our team, uh, Eli Levine, uh, and, and Kevin, who's not here, but uh, these guys are the ones who really put this on and, and did all the work and, and uh, did the logistics of this. So thanks to Courtney and Eli for, uh, for making this happen. So I've, I've been over sitting here in the corner uh, taking feverish notes, and not just because I've been very interested in, in the subject, uh, but also because this, uh, this subject hits uh, home particularly for me. Uh, my wife is a, a, a pulmonologist at Johns Hopkins and focuses on public health impacts. And so uh, every day I think she generally asks me how the day was. I think tonight she actually is going to be extremely interested in what I have to say. <laughs> um, to, to moderate our, our second panel, and this panel is going to really focus on the transformative impact of the supply chain uh, we'll talk some, uh, about some of the overall impacts, but want to focus in on the supply chain and, and how the supply chain can affect sustainability in, in the healthier hospitals uh, sphere. To moderate our second panel, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Becky Corman, who is the Deputy Associate Administrator at the EPA. Uh, Becky is, uh, has been at, at the EPA since the beginning of the administration and has handled environmental litigation and policy at the state and federal level Pre previously serving, serving in EPA's New York office and in the DOJ's environmental enforcement section. Also was uh, in the District of Columbia's Department of the Environment where she served as the general counsel. On our panel, our first panelist is Al Iannuzzi. He is the senior director of product stewardship at Johnson & Johnson. Thanks Al for being here. Al is the senior director in the worldwide environment, health and safety department at Johnson & Johnson where he directs the global product stewardship and green marketing programs. Prior to being at Johnson & Johnson, Al worked for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and he is author of the books Greener Products, The Making and Marketing of Sustainable Brands, and Industry Self-Regulation and Voluntary Environmental Compliance. Our second panelist is Kathy Gerwig, VP of Workplace Safety and Environmental Stewardship at Kaiser Permanente. Kathy has, uh, is responsible for developing, organizing, and managing a nationwide environmental initiative for the organization. And under her leadership, Kaiser has become widely recognized as, as an environmental leader in the healthcare sector. She has testified to Congress on the need for federal chemical policy reform, and she has appeared at numerous, numerous hearings on environmental issues. Kaiser Permanente is one of America's leading health care providers and not-for-profit not for health plans serving 8.9 million members, including Eli Levine, who's on our staff. Uh, Brad Perkins, the Executive VP uh, for Strategy and Innovation and Chief Transfor Transformation Officer at Vanguard Health Systems, is here with us today. Uh, Brad came to Vanguard from the CDC, where he served as Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer. And while at the CDC, he worked to lead the first large-scale modernization of the strategic direction since 1977. He has a long list of other distinguished leadership and research accomplishments at the CDC and elsewhere, including successful efforts in the United States and worldwide to control bacterial meningitis and other epidemic-prone infectious diseases. He's found, he founded and le led many of CDC's emergency response efforts over the last decade, including leading the CDC's 2001 anthrax bioterrorism response. Uh, John Meservy, he's the Director of Capital and Facilities Planning at Partners Healthcare, and, and he's the Chair of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative. Uh, John is an architect and the Director of, of, the, uh, of the initiative and is responsible for Partners' multi-year facility planning program and their large-scale construction projects. During the past decade, Partners has invested more than $2 billion in new facility construction and renovation in support of the highest level of clinical care, medical research, and teaching for, partner, for what Partners is internationally known. John founded the Partners Sustainability Initiative in 2008 and is chair of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative, a coalition of the nation's leading hospitals committed to reducing the environmental footprint of the hospital sector. And finally, Blair Sadler, Sadler is the senior fellow 
at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the former CEO of Rady uh, Children's Hospital. Blair is the founder of the center's Pebble, or sorry, Pebble program, a collaborative effort to identify, support, and disseminate the work of pioneering organizations throughout the world in evidence-based design. He has consulted with several health systems throughout the world, from Australia to Norway and beyond, and has written extensively about the business case for evidence-based design. Uh, Becky, take it away. Um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing all of the wonderful things that our panelists will have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, and also to get questions from the audience so that we can continue in this dialogue. So why don't we just start right out with um, Mr. Ianuzzi. I don't know if it's Dr. or Mr. However you want However to. You <laughs> Al. Either works, Al. but I go by Al typically. Okay, great, thank you. Go ahead. Do you want to make some remarks? Well, I'd just like to, um, first of all, thank uh, everyone for the privilege to be here and uh, real excited with the uh, Healthy Hospital Initiative uh, and being able to play a part as uh, Johnson & Johnson. We're uh, really, um, really excited about the opportunities. Uh, it's really uh, an awesome thing to see your customers looking for uh, greener products and focusing on energy efficiency and reducing their environmental footprint. And I know uh, it's a real core value to us through our credo. And um, we are just um, very much interested in, in uh, helping to meet our customers' needs in this regards. Um, thanks so much. And how about Kathy Gerwig? Care to make any opening remarks? Well, I. I We'll start by saying that uh, the reason that I think we're all here is because we want to reduce environmental contributors to disease. And so this is about health, and we might be talking about supply chain, we might be talking about energy, we might be talking about any variety of things, but um, I think the undercurrent for it all is that we want to reduce environmental contributors to disease. And there, if we don't use carcinogens, we will have fewer cases of cancer. If we don't pollute the environment, we will have fewer incidents of asthma. So uh, with that being the spirit that brings us all together, I think we're, we're looking forward to the dialogue. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Blair Sadler? Uh, thank you, uh, Vicki. I'm uh, kind of new to the environmental world, uh, but I can tell you as a hospital CEO for 26 years where this makes resonates with me completely is that probably over the last 15 of those 26 years, the quality safety improvement effort went from sort of the periphery with the IOM reports in the, you know, and kind of a lot of denial. No, we can't be making all these errors to saying, oh my God, we really have a problem. And I, you know, I will take you inside the boardroom of a hospital in America today. And the conversations are fundamentally different than they were 10 or 12 years ago. 10 or 12 years ago, most boards said that's the job of the medical staff. I know that's how I felt. I'm not a clinician. And now that's part and parcel of everything hospitals do in America, relentlessly getting better. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement has been a bellwether in helping hospitals learn how to do that, do that easily, and spread that. And then through the 100,000 Lives campaign in 06, 07, to take it to scale. And so as I look at this, I see this as a wonderful next logical progression on that train of improvement, of relentless improvement, because now, just like we had the data 10 and 12 years ago in other areas of quality and safety and harm, we now have, as you heard this morning from the panel, and you're going to hear for some other compelling examples, these are ready to go to prime time. Um, and so I think it's just so exciting because conversations are now occurring in boardrooms often around return on investment that would have been unthinkable three to five years ago. I can tell you, if you'd asked me my last few years, what's the carbon footprint of Rady Children's Hospital, I couldn't have told you. Now that is common knowledge. And so it's very exciting, and I commend the White House to be launching and hosting this conference today because, it, in my opinion, it just couldn't come at a better time. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Thank you very much for that and for these remarks. I think I'm going to just start with a question with you, if I may, um, which is with, to Brad Perkins. 
Um, can you also describe what drove you to this on a personal level? Um, why is it that you're recommending in your leadership role these adoptions of green practices and what steps you have recommended be taken in your organization? And then anyone else who'd like to answer? Um, so <clears throat> leaders change stuff and they do so in a purposeful way that inspires followers. And if you're leading in health and healthcare right now and you have not rebooted your operating system and loaded um, the notions of improving health, improving care, and doing both at a lower cost, you're sort of off the ranch. Um, and um, I think for people that are on that journey, on that new operating system in health and healthcare, the Healthier Hospital Initiative has really provided a great service um, in terms of a roadmap that you can, you can embark on, but it requires leadership. And, um, and you know, I think that's the ingredient that we're most short of, and I would encourage others to get on this program and get on this journey with Healthier Hospital in Initiative and with the triple aim notion. What we've done, and I'm, I'm representing uh, some of the work that the Healthier Hospital uh, Initiative advocates for food, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you can start off with the notion that hospitals are no places for donut shops. So if you have a donut shop or the equivalent in your hospital, you've got a problem. Um, it's off tone for what we're talking about with the triple aim, improving the health of the community, um, improving care and doing that a lower, at a lower cost. We have a toxic food environment in the United States and hospitals and healthcare need to firmly reject that environment and do so based on science. Uh, there's 79 million pre-diabetics in the United States. It's not hard to see. It's a tsunami of cost and tragedy that confronts our society and our basic fiscal stability as a country. So I'm really asking for all of you to lead health and health care in rejection of this toxic food environment. And there's some very simple things you can do, and we've done a number of them at, at Vanguard and have some examples of success. Um, I, you know, the, the challenge is broken up into three parts, basically a balanced menu challenge where you can start to reduce the level of meat consumption by 20% over a period of time. Um, increase the purchases of healthy beverages. And this is something we've taken really seriously at Vanguard. And in fact, on July 1st, we crossed an important threshold in our four Chicago hospitals where we eliminated sugar sweetened beverages. Okay, we're a little bit behind the schools, but we're there. And very few health care systems are, are there. With great science and 79 million pre-diabetics, let me ask you, why aren't you there? The other, the other notion of the challenge is sort of increased purchase of locally uh, produced and sustainable foods. And we're taking a tack on this in one of our new um, sort of greenfield projects where in a, in a city in between Austin and San Antonio, we're, we're starting at, at, at the baseline cultural level, building um, a community health commons, if you will. Uh, we're making a big investment. There'll be a hospital, but that's not what we started with. What we started with was a community multi-generational garden, okay? Our CFO was not so impressed because um, there's not much cash flow, but we have ignited in this community a cultural movement involving third and fourth graders in a collaboration with the school district and senior master gardeners to the point that kids weekly look forward to visiting this garden to spend time with their garden grandparents, okay? Let's talk about that as a basis for building a health and a health care organization. There's sad stories too. One child said, um, 
My mom is going to be so happy about these vegetables because we'll be able to add those to our ramen noodles. We eat ramen noodles every night. So let me invite your leadership into the construct of the Healthier Hospital Initiative. The water's fine. Come on in and lead. Okay. Oh, thank, thank you very much. That's very helpful. And, and if there are others who would also like to speak about maybe what their own personal view of this is, is as passionate as is Brad Perkins, it'd be great to hear. General Survey from Partners Healthcare, and I'm chair of the steering committee of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative. And I want to thank the uh, council for giving us the opportunity to be in the spotlight today. It's uh, we are a nascent organization, but it's growing rapidly. And as Brad mentioned, uh, you know, there are tremendous opportunities for all of us, all the hospitals. Uh, he's speaking to food. Uh, Kathy's probably going to speak to purchasing, environmentally preferable purchasing. Um, we have challenges in the area also of energy, of chemicals, of leadership, and waste. And uh, we're not each doing all of them necessarily. We're trying. But uh, there are other hospitals out there who I think uh, can contribute and participate with us. So we're inviting you to participate with us today. And uh, the stories we have, I'm sure, probably resonate for many of you. Uh, they are stories that are occurring in many hospitals around the country. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where I came from in terms of my commitment to sustainability. and. Please. Um, and that is through my training as an architect, uh, which gave me a, a fairly basic understanding of the way the world works in terms of built form and interaction of people with that built form. And of course, with the natural landscape. So uh, under the tutelage of very, several mentors along the way, I ended up uh, working in a hospital system and was responsible for building some new buildings. And through that process, I found that uh, I engaged in that new building process with almost every department within the hospital, obviously the physicians and nursing and caregivers, but also the environmental services, also the dietary, also the, uh, the, the, the uh, cleaning stuff, the watch people, um, security. So, uh, I at the same time, there was a push to move our hospitals to being green hospitals, to commit to the lead uh, checklist. And uh, with the support of, of the uh, CEOs of the hospital, we, we did that. And, and in fact, we built one silver and three gold uh, inpatient buildings. But the interesting thing is through their commitment to the lead process, in fact, they were also committing to a lot of the other activities which are fundamental uh, to uh, the HHI uh, promise. Um, so it, it wasn't much of a stretch, uh, but we are still stretching to embrace everybody who's, who's interested. Uh, our new buildings are, are operating at a significantly less energy intensity than, than uh, the baseline. If, if 250 kBTUs is the baseline, uh, the, the hospital we have in construction is, is at, at 142. It doesn't doesn't meet Jeff's 115, but he has, a, I think, a geothermal <laughs> system, which uh, if you can get geothermal, that really reduces your, your KBTUs dramatically. Uh, but for an urban hospital, I think 142 is, is pretty good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, around the energy, just generally around energy, um, we've committed to a 25 percent reduction in our energy consumption by 2014. We undertook an energy master plan for the system identified a series of conservation projects. They involved investment, but the payback on those investments are, are less than four years, and we are moving forward with it. And uh, we're, we're already seeing a 13% 13, 13 reduction in our energy consumption in the past three years. Um, we're also committing heavily to cogeneration, which we see as a bridging strategy to renewables. Uh, this is natural gas fired. Again, we're, not, we're in an urban environment, so we don't have the, the, uh, the luxury of biogas 
uh, uh, systems to fire those generators, so we're relying on natural gas, but uh, we're nevertheless seeing a, a, a reduction in consumption just because of the savings that accrue from increased efficiency from on-site generation. And then on the renewable side, uh, actually we have out on the street right now a, uh, an RFP for 30 megawatts of renewable power. So it'll be interesting to see how the marketplace responds to that kind of, of opportunity. Um, Hospitals are energy hogs, uh, no getting around it. We operate 24-7, and uh, uh, as do many of our research facilities. So there's a tremendous opportunity. It falls right to the bottom line uh, through the HHI program. There are many hospitals already signed up who have committed to uh, reducing their energy consumption, to taking that savings, and there are mentors within those hospitals who are available to help other hospitals who'd like to sign up and work with us. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I want to stick with the buildings for a moment and maybe ask you either a follow-up or ask you to jump in, Blair, on um, in addition to the energy efficiency aspect that we were just hearing about, what are some of the other benefits that hospitals or the healthcare industry are realizing as a result of greening their buildings? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, there's a larger backdrop to all of this called evidence-based design. You know, and it really parallels evidence-based medicine. And the Center for Health Design, that's a partner with this wonderful effort, has been a leader in that and as a nonprofit. And basically, in, in a nutshell, there are now between 1,500 and 2,000 published articles in peer-reviewed journals that speak directly to the relationship between things like single patient rooms and getting more or less hospital acquired infections. Somebody mentioned this morning about better air filtration systems. Um, variable, what we call variable acuity rooms, which is kind of code for you put all the technology in a room and instead of having to transfer a patient three or four times during their stay, which costs money, which disrupts their care relationships with their doctor and their nurse, is a tremendous dissatisfier and also often contributes to errors, you can avoid that. Uh, go to the employee side, go to nurses. Nurses have more back injuries than construction workers. And the last time I looked, patients were getting bigger, not smaller, and many nurses are getting older, not younger. This is a, an epidemic. So to put in things like hydraulic ceiling lifts to help lift patients can reduce direct costs by 83%. Um, lots of things you can do with natural light to give more reduce anxiety, uh, reducing overhead paging systems to make places quieter. You know, God, I, I want to get home from the hospital so I can start learning to sleep. That's kind of an anomaly, isn't it? You know, because there's so much noise all over the place. So what's so exciting about buildings, from my perspective, in the sustainability world, it's building on this platform of knowledge, uh, Vicki, that's emerged over the last 20 years. and between the two when you're going and building the new building that Jeff was talking about at his place, you not only have the value of what can you do from a sustainability standpoint, but from a lot of other efforts. The other thing I would say, just in closing, putting on my ROI hat, is we've done a lot of work in what, if you really did it right, what would the costing a better hospital, we call it the Fable Hospital, if you played pretend and put all the things together that you know how to do, including reducing energy that John's doing. And the answer is there'd be a one-time incremental cost, sort of Jeff's model, and you get the full payback within three years. So imagine a 300-bed hospital that would save you $10 million year after year after year. Yeah. And so it's changing those conversations in the boardrooms that we talked about earlier. Getting that awareness, it's not just about the one-time capital cost, it's the ongoing operating cost. And I think in terms of what Knox was saying about how do you get CEOs to think about this differently, it's recognizing we have a capital cost and an operating cost and savings, which is often dramatically greater. Thank you. Um, th those are really important pieces of information yeah. for everybody, I think, to take home. Um, is the boardroom getting involved in the supply chain decisions as well? And if they are, why are they doing so? We to that. At Kaiser Permanente, we have a very robust supply chain effort around environmental purchasing. And 
In terms of board involvement, I mean, most boards of directors don't put their fingers into that, uh, that level of an organization, but what I can tell you about our board of directors is that they regularly hear updates about what's going on in sustainability in the organization. Um, we've gone to them to talk about safer chemicals. We've talked about uh, climate change and our energy programs that are responsive to that. And one of, the, one of the six areas of focus for the Healthier Hospitals Initiative is engaged leadership. And to the extent that we can have a board of directors that's engaged enough to want to hear, to ask to hear reports on these types of programs um, means that our entire senior leadership, of course, pays attention to that. And that ripples throughout the organization. So it creates this really nice dynamic of we clearly have a lot of a grassroots interest in this, doctors and nurses and EVS workers and others who work in a hospital organization care deeply about these sorts of issues. They get the environmental health impacts. And to have that coupled with leadership and uh, board engagement is really important. So it is why the HHI focuses on engaged leadership. It doesn't mean just CEOs. It doesn't mean just the senior leadership. It really does include the board of directors. And, uh, and I know in our case at Kaiser Permanente, it's, uh, it's created a, a really wonderful, healthy dynamic. So how is it that, um, that the health that the Embracing of the sustain of the food chain, excuse me, of the <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, of the um, healthcare supply chain. I mean, how is that having an impact on the delivery of care, or how is it having a delivery on the health benefits that the patients are enjoying? One one really great example is mercury. So it used to be that every time you go in and have uh, your temperature taken or blood pressure taken, it was done with a mercury device, and today. Those, those days are long gone, I'll, I'll just say that, and that was no accident. Mercury came into the healthcare system very deliberately and it is out of the healthcare system very deliberately. And that's a result of customers coming together under the leadership of Healthcare Without Harm, one of the founding partners of the Healthier Hospital in Initiative, because they realized mercury is a neurotoxin. What is a neurotoxin doing in a healthcare environment? Mm -hmm. And by communicating that information throughout the healthcare sector and by um, notifying suppliers that we want mercury free products that meet our quality needs, that are affordable, do the trick but without the neurotoxin, and it turns out those alternatives were readily available. So we began that change out. Um, one important point I do want to make in terms of supply chain, because I, I, uh, all of us I know are asked this question all the time, and it has to do with cost. But you know, you probably had to spend more for that mercury-free device. So this is where we learned a really important lesson around supply chain management, and that is to focus on the cost of ownership, not just the cost of a particular device. So it is true. Mercury thermometer, mercury-free thermometer, yeah, the, the mercury-free one may cost a little more unit by unit, but what aren't we paying for? Well, we're not paying for any spills that happen. We're not paying for hazardous waste disposal of mercury. We're not paying uh, to not have an exam room available every time a mercury device breaks. Uh, we're not paying to train people to handle mercury, believe it or not, that's a requirement. You don't have to have a spill kit on a unit that isn't using mercury anymore. All of those things cost a lot of money. So it turns out the cost of ownership of going mercury free was uh, a bargain. And it's safer for patients, safer for workers, and uh, obviously safer for the environment. So that, that experience, when you think about what creates culture, well, experiences and beliefs change culture. And that changed the culture in Kaiser Permanente and many of the other organizations that are part of the Healthier Hospitals Initiative because we learned a lot of important information that we now can apply across the supply chain. So as we now look at other kinds of activities we want to engage in, they really are the six challenge areas of the Healthier Hospital Initiative. It's around food that Brad talked about. It's safer chemicals. It's environmental purchasing. It's leaner energy. It's waste. So those are all of the things. We're, we're, we can put our suppliers on notice that we're not being uh, mysterious about what we're going to be looking for next. We're looking for the things that HHI is promoting that we recruit many more hospitals around. Thank you. So those are six categories that you all are hitting in the supply chain. Um, and maybe, Al, could you maybe talk to us about the impact as the purchaser? 
that you're seeing happen in the supply chain? Yeah, so um, as you know, we sell products to hospitals, and uh, I've been in the environmental field all my life, uh, since all my work life, and to me it's uh, really the most important thing as far as environmental improvements go is when your customers start asking for more environmentally friendly products. And when the customers start asking um, people like me and, and large organizations like Johnson & Johnson start getting more leverage than we ever had before to bring greener products to market and to focus on um, things that are important to our customers because I mean that's what business is all about. So the whole idea of, um, of scorecards, which uh, a lot of the, the leadership came out of Kaiser Permanente and has been adopted by um, just about all uh, the hosp main hospital systems right now, is really making a big difference. So anytime that we have to uh, do a, a bid or a request for proposal for a hospital, we have to answer questions about the sustainability of our company, the sustainability of individual uh, products and, and units. So this is forcing a whole different discussion than we ever did before. And that's the, the greatest forces, I think, uh, of uh, making change out there are market pressures. So when a customer starts asking for things, you know, then suppliers, they'll have to follow because then it becomes a competitive competitive issue, and, and that's what we're good at, <laughs> competing with one another. And when this becomes uh, one of the, the um, key attributes of making decisions for purchase, then uh, it's even more important, gets more uh, attention within our, our management. So because of these, these type of things, it's enabled us to be able to, um, to, to develop uh, more greener products. So we developed this process called Earthwards, which is our process to make products greener. And so we're getting a lot more traction with that program in our company as a result of our customers asking for this. Uh, you know, mostly we think about customers, retail customers asking for it, but in the hospitals, the hospital customers are asking for these greener products. It's making such a, a big difference, and it's changing the whole paradigm of the way that we sell to, uh, to our customers. And that is a, a beautiful thing in my eyes, and uh, it's really a great thing for the environment. And not only is it good for the environment, but it reduces costs, too, as we heard some of the examples already. Um, when you're asking for a more energy-efficient product, uh, you know, I mean, and that's going to reduce greenhouse gases, and it's going to cost less to operate that piece of equipment. And when we start competing against that as one of the, the, um, the viewpoints of bringing a product to, to market, then um, everybody's a winner, you know, when it comes to that. Thank you. Um, would you say you all are early adopters, or is this becoming more pervasive throughout the Well, I mean, industry? I'll let others uh, speak, about, speak about that, but I can tell you, we, I know we've had a Design for the Environment program for, um, since the late 90s, so we've been looking at making our products greener for, for a long time. We like to think of ourselves as a leader, but I'll let our customers uh, <laughs> make that call, but uh, it definitely is on our radar screen, and it's definitely something that's a core value to us. It's part of our sustainability programs. It's embedded in the way that we do business, it's part of our credo. And as the largest healthcare company in the world, um, you know, we feel like we can uh, make a difference. And this could be a, a product differentiator, um, the, the greenness of our products. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, I think we heard a little bit from Blair about paying attention to nurses and the, the practitioners and the effects of um, all of the products in the building and the design. Um, are there, how are you all affirmatively engaging, or are you affirmatively engaging patients, the deliverers, in the design of your buildings or the purchases that you make? Um, or consumers, uh, patients? Yeah, definitely uh, on this journey, um, one of the early opportunities for a win uh, in multiple dimensions is to focus on improving the health of employees, um, improving their health directly through some of the food and beverage interventions, but also um, inspiring them. And I really learned this lesson from Walmart um, in 2006 when they introduced uh, a program to involve all of their associates called the Personal Sustainability uh, Pledge or Practice. Um, uh, and it was designed by environmental folks and so um, when all these pledges came back, the environmental folks were actually a little disappointed because many of the associates um, wanted to lose weight or stop smoking as their personal sustainability pledge. Well, I think that that's a really important observation because it reflects a problem with our orientation, not people's. So people 
naturally in the course of their lives connect these notions of environmental sustainability to their own health. It's we as leaders and silo drivers that disassociate these. And so we've worked very hard in Vanguard to, to bring um, environmental sustainability to the fore mm -hmm. around our definition of health and healthcare because it resonates and inspires our employees and our patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're talking to your CFO again, um, you can turn these things into uh, dollars that resonate with those audiences. I mean, I think it's something about, it's, some, it's a purpose that's much bigger than that, but all these things. I mean, the building stuff, the supply chain, the food, these things work in a financial environment now. This is mainstream. It's not fringe anymore. It's it's the it's it's doing business responsibly, and you know I think we hear that message across across the panel. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else on engaging the doctors, the nurses, the patients? Well, certainly in the whole building process of a replacement or a new building, is a golden opportunity for full engagement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deborah Levin from the center can tell you, you, we see this spectrum from people who just don't get it and don't do it, and it's a colossal missed opportunity to others who have them embedded every part of the way. And so guess what happens? They, first of all, it's a much, it's a much better environment. Two, they own it. Three, the culture that Seema and others talked about earlier this morning is fundamentally changed. And so when that move occurs, they go into places that they designed that feels right to them. And as a result, they're engaged, they're inspired, if your word, uh, they're delighted, they're proud to be there. And that word of mouth, that ripple effect is you know, infectious. Right. And I know, and Deborah can tell you about studies as well, of, in terms of re uh, recruitment and retention of employees in places that people like to work. We're all human, we like to work in environments where it's easy to find things, it's not noisy, it's not cluttered, um, we have privacy, you know, all of those things, but they take the way Kaiser has done with their Garfield Center, where they actually mock up rooms and have the best doctors and nurses come up and say, what if this works for you? You design it. So that's a big piece of this, Vicki. Uh, then on a smaller level, you can do very small things like changing the wayfinding and the signage. So it's not this way to otolaryngology, which 11 people understand what the word means, <laughs> to you know, have it written for and designed by, to reduce the unnecessary anxiety, the unnecessary confusion, you know, the unnecessary turmoil that employees feel and spend their time hunting and gathering for stuff rather than direct patient care. So it's a real motivator and there's a tremendous return yeah. to employees. Thank you. Uh, can I pick up on this theme of um, connecting uh, employee wellness and environmental health? Um, so we have a, an employee and physician engagement campaign called Reduce Your Use, and we periodically refresh that with new areas of focus. And the one that we're focused on right now is active transportation. And the idea is that if you walk or bicycle or take transit instead of driving, that you're more active, you'll be healthier, and your carbon footprint is less. So um, in thinking about the kinds of, you know, how do you uh, incent people to be engaged in that sort of thing? So uh, I'm presuming it's the practitioners, not the patients, are they? This is an employee <laughs> campaign, yeah. Employees, physicians, nurses, staff. It's an internal campaign. And uh, what we uh, decided was that they care more about a community benefit than they do about getting a tchotchke or a personal reward. So. Uh, the reward was if you pledge in this active transportation campaign that we would donate money that would go to buying bicycles to go to kids that were affected by Hurricane Katrina. And we have, as part of our community benefit, we have teams of volunteers that every year go to the Gulf area and support the rebuilding of that area. So we already have teams of people who volunteer their time to go there. And so we sent some bicycles with them on their last visit. 
and we matched them with kids in the area who needed the bicycles. And in one case, we had one of our volunteer physicians ended up teaching the kid to ride the bike upon presenting the bicycle. And you know that story has just uh, gone viral in the organization and created much more engagement and interest in, in the campaign. So it wasn't, you know, here's another environmental campaign. It was, here's a campaign about total health and here's how you can engage in a way that really benefits everybody. And it's, it's finding all of those linkages that I think um, in healthcare settings appeal most to folks. Mm, thank you. And how about in, um, engaging folks in the energy efficiency drive? Are they engaged? Well, they certainly engage. But, but uh, I, I sort of wanted to pick up a little bit on the, on the previous conversation. And um, you know, for instance, just last week, I was invited by the council of our chief nursing offices to come and make a presentation about the sustainability program across our hospitals, because they want to figure out how to engage uh, at their level. And obviously, there are tremendous opportunities. Uh, you know, er everything from the uh, sort of lean processes around uh, uh, delivery of medical services so that they're not spending all their time hunting and gathering, but they are providing direct patient care to uh, the noise on, on, the, uh, on the inpatient floors, to the food that's being served to the patients, uh, to, the, to the building environments, and then obviously to the, to the clinical products and medical products and what chemicals are contained in those products. And they're already engaged around the DEHP issue and, and IV tubing and, and IV bags. So, you know, I mean, they are, they are at the front line. And you know, I'm just so excited about the opportunity to go and speak with our chief nursing officers about what opportunities they have, and that in fact they are motivated and ready to go. Um, you know, they have told me, uh, uh, speaking individually with some of them, that um, you know they are, there are some very active nurses, and in fact, I know of some of them. They're working down in the operating rooms, for instance, and for the last 12 years they've been sorting through the waste streams and trying to get the different waste streams in place and. We have an, a, uh, you know, we have an OR pro program, a green OR program through uh, Practice Green Health that hospitals should take a look at because there is tremendous waste in the ORs, tremendous, tremendous opportunity. I mean, waste stream. I should talk about, uh, and tremendous opportunities for savings. So, you know, nurses uh, in particular are really at the front lines, and, and if we can uh, get them on board, then uh, the, the day is won. Um, so I also was back on the energy efficiency question. The Obama administration set a goal of 20% uh, energy efficiency for commercial buildings by 2020. And so we're curious to hear, how do you all think you're doing? Or are there things that you might be doing differently in order to further achievement of that objective? Well, we, I mean, we're, we're, we're on that track. Uh, in fact, we're... Um, you're being upstaged by the state of Massachusetts or Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which has a 25 percent, yeah, a 25 percent uh, uh, reduction goal by 2020. But that's on a 1990 baseline. So, in fact, for us, uh, because our energy uh, density increased from 1990 to 2008 by um, 18 percent, we've got to add the 18 percent to the 25 percent. So it's actually a 43 percent reduction in, in greenhouse gases is what we're looking at by 2020. And, th and that's, a, that's a significant challenge. And if, if, we're, if we are successful in reducing our consumption by 25 percent and then uh, finding another uh, 20 or so percent through co on-site cogeneration and renewables, uh, you know, we get, we get pretty close. The interesting thing, though, uh, you know, we've, we've been involved, actively involved in energy conservation since uh, the early 2000s. Uh, but in fact, our energy consumption is still increasing on an average of 1.5 percent per year. And so the question is, you know, why is that? How is that? What's driving that? Well, it's, it's in fact uh, clinical medical devices that are coming into the hospital environment. And, uh, you know, it, while we're up on the roof fixing the big air handlers, these boxes full of medical equipment are showing up at the loading dock and being plugged in. And, you know, it just wasn't on the radar screen. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there's some recent studies that indicate up to 25 percent of the energy consumption within an acute hospital uh, could be driven by uh, clinical equipment. And there, there are no Energy Star versions of MRIs mm -hmm. or, or any other clinical equipment. So, 
that's a real challenge, and we're, we're, starting, we're starting to bring it to the, to the medical device manufacturers. But a case in point uh, is a, uh, a hematology machine, which is a, our $800,000 piece of, of, uh, uh, of testing equipment that we use in the clinical labs in one of our hospitals was being replaced. And um, the labs brought this evaluation down to, to two companies who met all of the criteria that they had. And we asked them, well, what's, what's the difference in energy consumption? Well, it turned out that one used 22 percent more power than the other for the same, essentially the same process. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, well, tw you know, 22 percent across all the equipment in a hospital, that's driving uh, you the wrong direction. So, um, you know, there's a real challenge there. And uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's something we're, we're going to be engaging the uh, major manufacturers with, but uh, it has to be brought under control. Otherwise, all of our investments and in our conservation programs are just not going to work. I would, I would say that um, I'm really encouraged about the goal that has been set and, and our ability to meet that because it's such a great fit for what we need to do in healthcare generally. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to take 30 percent of cost out of our delivery of care. And I'll tell you what's happened is, is that all of, the, all of the areas of focus in the Healthier Hospital Initiative, including energy, are now considered to be part of that solution of taking cost out of our system. And, and, and so, you know, when they're at that level of dialogue in the boardroom, I'm really encouraged that, that you, can get, you can get some traction. And, and I'm saying this as, a, as an organization that pays taxes. Um, and, and I think when you get, when you get that you know, underlying a, a, um, you know, a, a solid business model, the potential for scalability is enormous. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm encouraged and inspired by the goal you set and confident that, that we can get there. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have time for some questions from the audience? Thank you very much, all. Um, sure, please, in the blue dress, and I'll repeat the question since there's no mics in the back. I'm curious, Daniel, with the VHA. Uh, we're in the association of 1,400 uh, Sure, thank you. So um, an association of nonprofits wants advice on how to engage the suppliers. I can maybe take that one. At Kaiser Permanente, we, uh, we spend billions of dollars a year on products to provide care to our patients. And I think the, um, Al mentioned earlier a scorecard tool that we developed, and that's one way to communicate to suppliers. So even if they don't have a product today that meets our wishes, they are definitely on notice where we're going, that we don't want chemicals of concern in the products that we're using in the provision of health care. The scorecard we referenced, um, which is available through links on the Healthier Hospital Initiative, is a device to bring environmental considerations into the product-by-product -product decisions that purchasers are making. So we ask specific questions at the point of bid, product-by-product. -product. Uh, we name certain chemicals, like is it free of PVC, does it have flame retardants, et cetera, uh, 10 specific questions around chemicals and waste, and those get scored. And that score goes into the decision making about the product. It's right there with the quality, the efficacy, uh, service, et cetera. So when suppliers have to fill out that information, first thing is, oh, they have to know that information, which isn't always obvious. In some cases, they have to do some digging to be able to tell us if a chemical is in there or not. And if they really can't find out, we assume the negative, that the, that the chemical is present, and so they get a, a deduction for that. So that's a tool that's now widely available. We started using it. We applied it to about a billion dollars worth of our spend. It was taken to the firm that does our contracting, uh, and it expanded from there. And now m most of the uh, group purchasing organizations are utilizing a scorecard that was developed with that as sort of background and it's being applied to more than 135 billion dollars worth of spend. So when we think about the
the Healthier Hospitals Initiative and the, you know, why are we all here supporting it? It's because we can leverage that kind of thing. It's not just a tool that Kaiser Permanente can use, but by sharing it, by improving on it, by having everybody utilize it, the leveraging power is immense and um, suppliers cannot ignore that kind of leveraging power. And, and they aren't, you know, the, the DEHP free plastics is a, is a perfect example with Dignity and, and then Kaiser and hopefully partners very soon uh, contracting for DEHP IV uh, uh, bags and tubing. The word got out in the, in the, in the trade press, in the plastics press, so Plastics Today magazine, which isn't one of my everyday reads, was calling me for interviews, you know, what's going on here, why, why are you heading in that direction, um, and they had a follow-up article that, uh, because there are some technical issues, it's not just, you know, in terms of manufacturing and, and reliability of this product, uh, they had a follow-up story about a, a, a small company out in Ohio that was uh, uh, perfecting the welding process that they needed to perfect in order to produce uh, this, this product with reliability, because I, I guess there'd been some leaks and other things. And so for three weeks running in, in the trade press, there were articles about the sort of the, the, the trickle-down consequences of these uh, large organizations moving in that direction. And then that was followed up by at our Clean Med conference in Denver in May, where representatives of three different plastics organizations came to the conference and mm -hmm. were talking with us about, you know, what's going on here and where you're headed and why do you think, you know, why do you think this is an important, pla important pro uh, chemical to remove from the supply chain? So, Vicki, I think this, you know, to pick up on something Gary mentioned in the first panel about the purchasing power, you've heard three or four very powerful examples. These are game changers, mm -hmm. you know? And I think hospitals sort of felt victims to sort of, well, that's the menu, that's what it is, that's what we're going to choose from to say, wait a minute, we have a voice at this table, we can change the conversation as Kaiser has done and others have done, and now through the sharing of HHI, and the, the people who are leading this are extraordinarily generous, and not just holding that purchasing power to them, but, you know, and that's what Gary was referring to. So there's almost, the sky is almost the limit here. And I think Al would agree. I mean, you guys are leading it. Uh, you said it, it's the market forces that are gonna drive mm -hmm. this. Yeah. It's very I, exciting. I would just add on to, all it takes is like one, uh, loss of sales. <laughs> you know, if a company loses a sale, let's say it's a, a PVC free blood bag. We've seen a lot of that in the press where some health systems have uh, moved away from that. We heard about that already. But let's say you're manufacturing PVC containing blood bags and you're at a competitive disadvantage now. How long is it going to be before you start changing? I mean, you know, it just takes one loss of sale that, that gets <laughs> in the press. And it could even be something that's not even in your product line. I could tell you, I use that. We don't sell blood bags, but I use that as an example for my own management saying, look what's going on in this industry. You know, that's why we have a target list of materials we want to try to move out of our product so that, you know, we will not be at a competitive disadvantage and maybe even in a competitive advantage. So when you start asking as customers for for uh, more greener products and you get really specific what you mean by that, you know, we will listen. <laughs> Suppliers will, will listen because they want to be in the game. Thanks. I'm going to grab that gentleman with the green tie. Great. Okay, thank you. So is that your experience? You're seeing collaboration amongst the vendors now as a result, in addition to competition. Um, okay, 
Um, thank you. I'm sorry. I don't think that we have time for any more, but I think that there was one more remark that you were yeah, going to make. Yeah, I think as the oldest person in the room, I want I to know, say something. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't be uh, so sure. <laughs> okay. um, I just thought, one of you, in, in, in all our correspondence with Eli and Seema in planning this and Courtney, uh, one of the things, one of your objectives, at least I read either in the lines or between the lines, was uh, how we could all partner with you all. Mm -hmm. And were there some nuggets that were coming out? And I'm sure already a number have. But I'd just like to be explicit for a minute. Please. I think that uh, the synergy between some of the bold goals you've said and we have are, you said it, you know, they're part and parcel. So that magic and that catalytic effect is already occurring. Uh, and that's not to be minimized. Uh, and the way you're pushing the messages out is going to be great. Um, and Sherry and everyone will work with you hand in glove on that. So first thing is awareness, awareness, awareness. It's, I think, could have an uh, exponential effect on that, not to be minimized. Uh, and it'll be in various journals like Plastics and all kinds of places uh, that are very powerful. Uh, but I had two other thoughts. One would be to be thinking and brainstorming about what kind of policies, either they carrots or sticks, incentives or, you know, rewards, to hospital systems uh, to encourage this. And you know we don't have a three by five card that says what mm -hmm. those are, mm -hmm. but we're very serious about that. Mm -hmm. And I think speaking, if I could see him on behalf of the group, uh, we'd be very like, happy to work with you in any one of these six areas. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is of further research. So while in many areas we now feel that there's enough data, there's enough research, there's enough science, there's enough knowledge to be ready for prime time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be putting these six out. Uh, as Brad can tell you, in another three to five years, there could be another six. Oh, yeah. um, and so peeling, it's like peeling the layers of the onion. As we get smarter about this, that is, answers a question, but it often raises three more. Mm -hmm. And what you have is a very robust and excited, committed group of hospitals and organizations, many of whom are parts of big time research arms, in schools of public health, schools of medicine, schools of nursing, schools of business, who will be delighted to work with you, as well as the cost savings things, uh, big picture. And we would really welcome opportunities with whatever the appropriate agencies are that have this on your radar screen to, uh, to do that. So. Uh, how, how did I do, Gary? Was that? We just, no, and we, we appreciate we just that. Wanted, we wanted to get that. Thank you, thank you. I think we really all would be very grateful to continue the engagement. It's been valuable thus far, and we look forward to more of it. So thank you, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thanks so much to Pam too. And, and thanks to Becky and our, our moderator uh, for the first panel, Maria Vargas. To close out uh, this uh, session uh, and this event, uh, we're very, I have the privilege of being able to introduce uh, Nancy Sutley, who is the chair of the Council, the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And uh, over the last two decades, um, Nancy has served in senior leader leadership posts at the California EPA, uh, was appointed by President Clinton uh, at the US EPA. Uh, she was the top energy advisor to Governor Gray Davis. Uh, served on the Water Resources Control Board in California. Uh, most recently uh, was the Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles and uh, currently is uh, my boss and uh, the uh, top environmental advisor uh, to President Obama, uh, Chair Nancy Sutley. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me add my welcome, I guess, on the last uh, thing to the White House. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I just came in for a little bit of this last discussion, and it sounds like uh, a lot of good ideas uh, have been put out on the table and a lot of opportunity, I think, to follow up. Um, so let me just also say thank you to, uh, to Rohan and to his team who's uh, put this together and everybody who helped organize this. And uh, you know, I think this is a conversation that's a start, uh, as, as you just said, uh, one where we can continue uh, to work together on this very important issue. Uh, you know, our healthcare facilities are really important institutions in communities, 
and the opportunity to make them greener uh, and more energy efficient is tremendous and, uh, and important for our nation. The President is very strongly committed to protecting our environment and preserving our natural resources. And he does that not only as the President, but um, as a father, uh, as he works uh, to protect our environment for generations to come. And he said again and again that he believes that energy efficiency and clean energy are essential to our economy, essential to our security, and essential to the health and prosperity of Americans. We have the best innovators and the best entrepreneurs in the world, and that's helped us to grow uh, and to thrive throughout our history. And now it's really time, as you uh, already have started, to, to tackle this very important challenge and this real opportunity to grow clean energy industries and green jobs that will keep us safe, that will keep us healthy and prosperous into the 21st century. You know, for decades, uh, volatile energy prices have threatened economic security for millions of middle-class Americans. It hits consumers and businesses very hard, including hospitals and health care facilities, rising gas prices, rising energy prices that really strain the uh, budgets of millions of American families. And it's a familiar story. We're all familiar with it. But to really to restore uh, the lasting security for middle class families, we need a sustained plan for American energy. And to create an economy that's built to last, we need to take control of our energy future by out innovating and out building our global com competitors. And one of the strongest ways that we can uh, fight to create jobs, uh, to curb pollution, and to save people money is through a robust commitment to energy efficiency. In the United States spends $1.1 trillion a year on energy. That's about 8.8% of our GDP. If we came, became, as a country, 20% more energy efficient, we'd save more than $200 billion annually. And that's money that goes back into people's pockets, back into businesses to, to grow and to prosper. You know, in all kinds of buildings, including uh, medical labs and hospitals and community clinics uh, and everything else, consume about 40 percent of the energy in the U.S. Uh, the, the healthcare industry commands nearly 10 percent of total energy use uh, by commercial buildings, and, and the spending from this sector alone is about $8 billion a year. Investments in energy efficiency allow hospitals to reduce their energy costs, uh, saving millions, and improving the bottom line. And as hospitals reduce their energy costs, they can take these savings and allocate resources to, to whatever, to improving patient care and to investing in uh, equipment. And energy clearly uh, is a major issue for hospitals for a lot of reasons. Uh, hospitals face escalating energy costs at the very same time that all the advanced technologies that's helping to improve the health of Americans are rapidly increasing the demand for energy. And also for hospitals, as you know, energy reliability is an incredibly important issue to provide round-the-clock care, uh, even during catastrophes that may affect an entire community. And that's why, as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the Obama administration has made an unprecedented commitment to expand energy efficiency and the overall energy retrofit market. Energy efficiency and renewable energy can increase a, a hospital's energy reliability even during times of crisis. And the pa purchasing power of the healthcare industry, as you all have been talking about, has really created a market for greener products and more advanced technologies, making hospitals safer even safer and more environmentally friendly. And this is just the beginning. Working with you will make sure that smart programs like these continue to support jobs, businesses, and healthy communities across the country. Now, we asked you to come here today because you're the ones who are making this happen on the ground. And so we thank you for your innovation and your hard work. Uh, this administration is on your side, and we'll keep doing everything that we can to support you. Together, we'll continue to pursue 
a healthy and prosperous future for your communities and for all Americans as we create healthier hospitals. And we hope that this great event marks the beginning of a partnership between the Healthier Hospitals Initiative and the Obama administration. And we look forward to working together closely in the months and years to come. So thank you again, all of you, for being here today, for, for sharing your thoughts and your ideas, the things that you're working on, and uh, talking to each other and talking to us about the, the opportunities uh, to create a, a, a healthier future. So uh, we thank you again for coming and uh, wish you all safe travels if you've come from around the country. And uh, we're really glad that you came here today and hope that you uh, found this as valuable as I know uh, we all have. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nancy, and that concludes our event. Thanks, everyone.